Greetings. We are going to continue on in Chapter 12, The Nervous Tissue, during these video lectures. However, I'm going to start in the middle of the, of the lecture. We've already gone through all the way up through and including a lot of the electrical signals in, in the neurons. So we're going to begin about a third of a way in. Uh, some of it may be a repeat of what we've done in lecture. If, not, if so, then you can just listen once again. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy the video. Electrical signals in neurons. So we're going to back up for a second and go back over some of these electrical signalings that we find in neurons. Remember, neurons are one of two different types of cells in the body that are capable of responding with an electrical signal. So they are electrically excitable. Muscle cells are the other type of of cell that are electrically excitable. When we talk about the electrical signals in neurons, we're going to be looking first at something known as the resting membrane potential. So we'll see that on the next slide, uh, discussion of what the resting membrane potential. So that's always happening in the background. And it's what establishes the normal difference in charge across the neuron membrane. Then we have two different types of changes that will occur in a neuron, an action potential and a graded potential. Action potentials are localized change, I'm sorry, action potentials are long distance changes and they're usually associated with the axons. Graded potentials are local membrane changes uh, and we'll see a lot about the difference between those and the action potentials. Graded potentials are found only in the neural cell bodies and in the dendrites. All right, so before we really get into a discussion of resting membrane potentials, action potentials, or graded potentials, we have to understand the types of ion channels that will exist across a neuron or muscle cell membrane. Ions cannot go through the phospholipid bilayer. Lipids are nonpolar. Polar material, like ions, cannot go through them. So they require facilitated diffusion channels. So we have a couple of different types of facilitated diffusion channels. We have some that are always open, known as leakage channels, and some that are typically closed but have to be stimulated to be open. We call those gated channels. So the leakage channels are always open. The nerve cell has a lot of potassium leakage channels and very few sodium leakage channels. So the membrane is very permeable to potassium and a lot less permeable to sodium. So the sodium potassium pump is pumping out three sodiums. So we get three sodiums, three sodiums out in the sodium potassium pump and two potassiums pumped in. All right. So we initially set up a little bit of a difference across the phospholipid bilayer with this positive on the outside and negative on the inside because we're pumping in fewer positive charges than we pump out. And then in addition to that, we have the leakage channels. And the leakage channels will allow lots and lots of the potassium to flow out. So you'll get lots of potassium leaking out and very little sodium leaking in. So in the end, we end up with a resting membrane potential that's 70 millivolts more negative on the inside compared to the outside. So that's what's always going on in the background. We always have that sodium potassium pump and those leakage channels. Then we also have some gated channels and these respond to a stimulus of some sort. Ligand gated channels open or close in response to a chemical stimulus. That means you add a chemical to the channel to open it up. A good example of this was the acetylcholine receptors in the muscle where the acetylcholine had to attach to the receptors and that opened up sodium channels and allowed the muscle membrane to depolarize. The other types include well, I'm going to skip down to the bottom. Mechanically gated ion channels 
respond to some sort of a change to the literally the shape of the membrane or vibration across the membrane that opens up those channels and then we have voltage gated channels that respond to a change in the membrane voltage so if our resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts there will be a threshold voltage a threshold voltage and if the membrane voltage moves from negative 70 millivolts to this threshold voltage, and in most neurons this is going to be negative 55 millivolts, if it moves that threshold voltage, voltage-gated ion channels will open up. These are usually going to be found in the axons. All right, so just a little look at the different types of ion channels in the plasma membrane. We have first the leakage channel. So here's an example of a potassium leakage channel. And you can see that it's simply allowing the potassium to move down its concentration gradient, randomly opens and closes. Whenever it's open, the potassium will leak in. Then over here, we have the mechanically gated so the mechanically gated channels and so for these to open up we have to have some sort of literal change some pressure that occurs to the membrane and the gate will pop open there's the gate popping open and ions will be able to move across the membrane then we also have uh, some chemically gated channels or ligand gated channels so sometimes you may hear me refer to these as chemically gated channels sometimes as ligand gated channels the great example is here with acetylcholine so we see acetylcholine here and here having been added to a receptor and now that allows ions to pass through the membrane and then finally over here we have the voltage gated so if we look at this example down at the bottom is going to show you the voltage going from negative 70 millivolts all the way and changing to negative in this example negative 50 millivolts now that's more than the threshold voltage so that means that the channel will open up and ions can pass across that membrane all right so coming back to this resting membrane voltage all right. Negative ions will line up along the interior, positive ions on the exterior. And we say that the cell is polarized. It acts like a little battery. So there's a potential difference across that membrane. And in most neurons, that's going to be right around negative 70 millivolts. So that exists because we have differences in those ion concentrations much of this differences in the ion concentration will be due to the sodium potassium ATP pump remember this is a form of active transport actively moving lots of sodium outside so we see lots of sodium outside of the membrane Wherever you have sodium, you'll also have lots of chloride. So we also see lots of chloride outside. Now you'll notice this is negatively charged. Right? The chloride is negatively charged, but that doesn't matter. Right? There are, comparing the inside to the outside, we still have lots more positive charges outside than inside. So it's okay that we have some negative charges on the outside because the inside, the cytosol, has lots of positive charges even though it's more negative compared to the outside so and in addition to that we have the membrane the difference in the membrane permeability so we get lots of those positively charged potassiums leaking out so the inward flow of sodium can't keep up with that outward flow of potassium and any potassium I'm sorry any sodium that comes in any sodium that comes in will get pumped out by that sodium potassium ATPase pump. All right, so here's just a little view of our factors that contribute to the resting membrane potential. You see we have our sodium potassium pump, all right, requires ATP energy for it to operate, so that's active transport. And then we have our leakage channels. This is showing uh, one two here's a second 
potassium leakage channel to only one, but in reality it's, there's a lot more permeability to potassium than to sodium. All right, so now we're going to look at our graded potentials. This is a change away from the resting membrane potential. There are two different ways that graded potentials might be expressed. You either might hyperpolarize the membrane or depolarize the membrane. So first hyperpolarization means that the difference across the membrane becomes even greater. The membrane becomes in even more negative. So this top graph shows hyperpolarization. We can see that we start at our negative 70 millivolts start at our negative 70 millivolts and as we uh, stimulate the membrane the inside will dip down whoops I don't want to do that the inside will dip down and we become even more negative than we were before hyperpolarized more polarized D meaning not depolarization the membrane becomes more positive that means the inside becomes more positive than it was previously so once again we start here with our negative 70 millivolts and this time it increases and we go up. I don't know why that's doing that and then we go up and then back down All right so it becomes a little more positive negative 60 is more positive than negative 70. These are also graded. That means that they can vary in their amplitude. Now the amplitude is the difference between here and here on this green line. That difference right there is the amplitude of this wave. So if you have a very small stimulus you would get a small change away from the resting membrane potential. If you get a large one, you're going to get a larger change. So that's why we call them graded. And it also depends, um, and it's also localized. So the only place where this graded potential can occur is where the stimulus is occurring. And for that reason, with graded potentials, you'll only see them in either ligand gated, so you'll see ligand gated channels opening up and causing graded potentials and also mechanically gated channels will cause a graded potential. Voltage gated channels are associated with action potentials. Alright, so here's just a few examples of these different types of channels. So we have our resting membrane potential over here, negative 70 millivolts. We apply a little pressure. So if we apply pressure, then that must be a mechanically gated channel causing some depolarization. Uh, you could have uh, a chemically gated channel or ligand gated channel. So once again, here's our acetylcholine binding to a receptor, and that's going to cause depolarization. Right. But you might also get a ligand gated channel. In this case, we have a glycine channel. So glycine is added here. And this is going to produce a hyperpolarizing potential. So this time, you have negatively charged. These are chloride ions. And remember, whoops, don't want to do that again. These are chloride. Chloride. And chloride, remember, is found in high quantities outside. So now we're bringing negative charges in. And when you bring negative charges in, that means you're going to make the inside of the membrane even more negative than it was before. All right, so remember these are graded potentials. They will vary in proportion to the strength of their stimulus. So if you look down at the bottom where you have the bar graph, we have a weak stimulus, stimulus one. If you look straight up, it may it may be depolarizing, but only slightly depolarizing. If you have a little stronger stimulus, like in the blue stimulus 2, and you look up the amplitude of the waveform, so we see this amplitude right here, difference between here and here, is a little bit higher. And then when we finally get to the purple one, the stimulus 3, it's the strongest stimulus, and we see the greatest amplitude away from that resting membrane potential. So that's why we call these things graded potentials. 
graded potentials can also sum up. So uh, let's say we had a first stimulus, stimulus one. Uh, you would see in this case we're showing this as a, oops, I don't know why I keep doing that. We, we're showing this as a depolarizing. So we go up. Now if we were only with this one, it would come back to the resting membrane potential. If we had a second stimulus all on its own, it would also depolarize, go up, and then come back down to the resting membrane potential. But if they come in fast enough, right here, what we see is you get an even greater response. Right? So you can sum together the graded potentials. Just a hint for the future, you cannot sum an action potential. Right? So you can sum together a graded potential, but not an action potential. All right, so I'm going to pause the video here, and we'll pick up with a second video talking a little bit about the generation of an action potential, and we'll look in a lot of detail in the next video about the, uh, the diagram associated with an action potential.